Okay, so I think we're ready to start. Uh, buongiorno, hello to everybody. Um, the panel is about ending poverty, protecting the planet, and ensuring prosperity for all. So that's quite an ambitious uh, target which the United Nations have set. Uh, it's a very ambitious target. And what we'll try to do today, together with the panelists, is to show how food and food systems play a very important role to achieve this target. Uh, I am Luca Di Leo, and I work for the, I had media relations for the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition Foundation, uh, as well as the hashtag uh, of the International Journalism Festival. If you could please use the hashtag food sustainability, and you can also provide questions with the hashtag food sustainability. Um, over there you'll see also the, um, uh, the, the hashtags. Um, I uh, want to um, basically kick it off with a video uh, of the Barilla Foundation. The weather is crazy. Forests are disappearing. A lot of people do not have food, while others eat too much. The population keeps growing, and there are more and more wars and people who are forced to leave their homes. We pollute our environment and throw away our food. The BCFN is a multidisciplinary think tank created to deal with all the food and nutrition challenges we face. Together we can understand, act, and change. Tomorrow depends on what we eat today. Leave us a better world. So as you can see, the food choices that we make have a huge impact on the planet, and this is something that is often underestimated. So I'd like to welcome the panelists here with me. To my left, uh, Ludovica Principato. She's a researcher at the Berla Center for Food and Nutrition Foundation. Uh, then we have Lucio Caracciolo, who's the president of Macrogeo. Farhana Haq Rahman, the director general of uh, Interpress Service. Magid Sror, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, I'm doing my best, who is a data analyst at Interpress Service. And finally, Laura Garzoli, who is the winner of a Barilla Foundation competition of 2017 called Young Earth Solutions. So we, I'd like to start by talking about the food paradoxes, which were highlighted in the video, and which are something that, again, are often underestimated. Um, the, the big food paradoxes of our time uh, are really striking. Uh, we have, on the one hand, uh, people who die of hunger, and the figure has actually been increasing, uh, 815 million people who suffer from hunger. And on the other, um, we have uh, people who uh, die uh, because of the uh, consequences of obesity. Um, then the, the second big paradox is uh, that increasingly we are feeding animals and cars instead of feeding people. 
Uh, and even this one is a, a very, very striking uh, uh, paradox of our time. Uh, that it, what is perhaps uh, the one that uh, people uh, consider the most uh, in, the, in, in, in certain parts of the world is the one that has to do with food waste and the fact that we waste a lot of food despite the problem with feeding the hungry. So these paradoxes are the ones that the Barilla Foundation has been focusing on since the start in 2009. Um, the aim is to raise awareness uh, around these uh, food paradoxes. And obviously the journalists, the media have a key role to play uh, in this, which is why, uh, which is why we're here. Um, from raising awareness, uh, the attention of the Barilla Foundation quickly turned into trying to find solutions to tackle these paradoxes. Um, and uh, what was an important turning point was the Universal Expo, which took place in Milan in 2015, when the Barilla Foundation presented the Milan Protocol, so uh, a set of uh, proposals to try and tackle these uh, huge food paradoxes of our time. Um, the Milan Protocol uh, was eventually uh, taken by, um, up by the Italian government as the Milan Charter, um, and it was presented to the UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon at the time um, to try again to find uh, a solution to these, to these uh, food paradoxes. Um, the, the UN's attention has, has since uh, turned to the Sustainable Development Goals. I'd like to ask the people in the audience here, um, who knows what the Sustainable Development Goals are? Can, can, you raise, can you raise your hand to see how many people are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, that's, that's what I feared, that uh, there, aren't, there aren't so many people who are familiar with them. Uh, but what we, we, what we want to try and prove today, together with my panelists, is that uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which you see here, they are the seven, 17 goals which the United Nations, the more than 190 countries of the United Nations, signed up to in 2015. And we want to show that a lot of these are actually st strongly related to the food systems and to our food choices. Um, so let me now pass it over to uh, Ludovica, Ludovica Principato. Uh, she will talk to us about the Food Sustainability Index, which is a project uh, that the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition did together with The Economist. Uh, and she will take us through some best practices uh, of countries around the world on food and sustainability. Grazie, Luca. Buongiorno a tutti. Sono Ludovica Principato, ricercatrice della Fondazione Barilla e cerchiamo adesso di capire un pochino in effetti il nesso che eh, il cibo e i sistemi agricoli più sostenibili per il futuro hanno e la relazione che questi hanno nei 17 goal di sviluppo sostenibili proposti dall'ONU entro il 2030. Eh, con, con la Fondazione Barilla, insieme all'Economist Intelligence Unit, abbiamo proposto il Food Sustainability Index, che in sostanza è un indice di sostenibilità alimentare che va a, ad analizzare 34 paesi, che rappresentano circa l'87% del PIL mondiale, e vede come questi paesi si stanno comportando seguendo i tre paradossi che ha citato Luca. Quindi siamo andati a vedere più di 35 indicatori, e abbiamo visto come questi paesi diciamo, stanno affrontando le sfide salutari, noi abbiamo visto che accanto a eh, problemi seri di insicurezza alimentare, quindi abbiamo oltre 815 di milioni di persone che soffrono la fame e per la prima volta appunto quest'anno questi milioni sono aumentati rispetto ai decenni passati. Vediamo però che da un lato abbiamo questo problema di insicurezza alimentare, dall'altro abbiamo il problema molto serio anche dell'obesità e della malnutrizione. Poi ci sono i problemi di sprechi alimentari, non tutti sappiamo che un terzo di tutto il cibo che produciamo lungo la filiera agroalimentare viene sprecato. Questo corrisponde davvero a, a un quantitativo enorme che abbiamo stimato possa sfamare in qualche modo gli 815 milioni di persone che soffrono la fame per ben quattro volte. 
volte. Quindi questo è già un primo punto, se pensiamo agli sprechi alimentari, gli sprechi alimentari sono stati inseriti all'interno di un Sustainable Development Goal che è il numero 12, quindi Sustainable eh, Consumption and Production, ma in realtà se noi riusciamo a diminuire i nostri sprechi alimentari lungo la filiera possiamo anche raggiungere appunto l'obiettivo di Zero Hunger che è appunto eh, uno dei, dei principali obiettivi di, di sviluppo sostenibile. Il, il, terzo, il terzo paradosso molto importante appunto che, che ha citato Luca è quello di, di un'agricoltura più sostenibile. Ehm, questo è, è fondamentale perché noi abbiamo delle risorse agricole limitate, si stima che se continuiamo a produrre in questo modo con una popolazione globale che sta aumentando eh, notevolmente potremmo non avere appunto una superficie agricola eh, utilizzabile e in più c'è un, un problema anche di impoverimento del suolo, potrebbe addirittura il suolo impoverirsi fino al 30%. Quindi noi abbiamo tenuto conto di questi tre paradossi, eh, io ho citato appunto alcuni di questi obiettivi di sviluppo sostenibile, in particolare per gli sprechi alimentari, se vogliamo continuare sempre con gli sprechi alimentari, ehm, attenzione anche alla povertà, perché gli sprechi alimentari non solo hanno degli impatti ambientali notevoli, che vedremo in un, in un attimo, ma gli sprechi alimentari causano degli impatti economici ehm, pazzeschi, eh, si, si pensa che appunto è stato stimato che soltanto la questione economica, quindi il costo degli sprechi alimentari, quindi cibo che viene prodotto però completamente inutilizzato costa fino a un trilione di dollari. Questi, diciamo, questi costi non sono dei costi che ricadono soltanto sugli agricoltori, sui produttori di cibo, ma ricadono anche su di noi, sulle famiglie. Noi sappiamo che all'incirca, soprattutto nei paesi sviluppati, il 30% di quello che compriamo spesso finisce nella spazzatura. In Italia, per esempio, questo costa circa 500 euro a famiglie ogni anno, che insomma è una cifra rilevante. E, se andiamo a vedere eh, la questione de, dell'agricoltura, l'agricoltura sostenibile oltre ovviamente a, ad avere un impatto positivo nei consumi di acqua e di, e di suolo che sono sempre degli obiettivi di sviluppo sostenibile eh, dell'ONU è molto importante anche per raggiungere l'obiettivo numero 8 che è quello del decent work and economic growth, quindi cercare di pagare adeguatamente gli agricoltori può anche migliorare le loro condizioni di vita e in qualche modo anche aumentare l'occupazione, così come l'importanza dell'innovazione, l'innovazione tecnologica e investire nell'innovazione tecnologica può davvero aiutare anche e soprattutto i paesi in via di sviluppo, pensiamo per esempio a tutti i sistemi diciamo appunto tecnologici e decisionali che ci stimano quanto pioverà e se pioverà, quindi appunto l'utilizzo per esempio dell'irrigazione più concentrata ehm, è, è fondamentale. E infine proprio nella parte di salute, eh, la salute è fondamentale, c'è cioè l'obiettivo numero 3 di sviluppo sostenibile che è proprio Good Health e ormai sappiamo che la stragrande maggioranza delle malattie croniche a cui eh, purtroppo eh, insomma, siamo, stiamo vedendo, siamo diciamo, soggetti come per esempio obesità, alcune tipologie di cancro sono dovute a, anche a, in parte o per molto a una cattiva alimentazione. E per quanto riguarda appunto ehm, la, la questione, proprio il nostro report eh, sull'indice di sostenibilità alimentare, noi abbiamo diciamo, fatto un paragone fra questi paesi, non con l'obiettivo di creare una competizione fra, fra questi ultimi, ma con l'obiettivo di trovare delle buone pratiche ehm, da, da prendere a spazio come spunto tra i paesi e con l'obiettivo anche di vedere un miglioramento poi appunto de, 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 degli obiettivi di sostenibilità di questi paesi lungo gli anni perché siamo già infatti alla seconda release. Quindi se vogliamo andare a vedere come, come siamo messi eh, anche come Italia, mh, diciamo andando a vedere l'indice di sostenibilità alimentare generale, ehm, l'Italia è in settima posizione, eh, quindi sicuramente non male, i primi tre sono Francia, Germania e Giappone. Ehm, diciamo eh, sì assolutamente grazie ehm, sì tanto parlo a braccio dunque la Francia, la Francia si sta sicuramente la Francia ha degli ottimi ehm, indicatori per quanto riguarda la salute hanno dei tassi di obesità molto bassi eh, hanno, non hanno diciamo particolari ehm, difficoltà alimentari mi, di, 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 diciamo difficoltà di micronutrienti eccetera e, e soprattutto hanno una, delle interessantissime politiche alimentari contro gli sprechi alimentari sono stati il primo paese in Europa a proporre una legge contro gli sprechi alimentari 
pari anche molto stringente eh, che appunto ehm, prevede questo in sostanza i supermercati quindi soprattutto lato retail i supermercati grandi quindi stiamo parlando di quelli dai 400 metri quadri in, in su non possono più gettare il cibo in scadenza ma sono obbligati per legge o a donarlo alle persone più bisognose o a diciamo svenderlo a noi consumatori a dei prezzi vantaggiosi questo perché perché era stato visto che e eh, lo sappiamo tantissimi prodotti nel supermercato vengono vengono gettati via quando in realtà sono, eh, sono diciamo, appena scaduti, quindi c'è diciamo, questa possibilità eh, per i supermercati, anzi in Francia sono obbligati, pena molte molto severe, a donarli. L'Italia, siamo alla settima posizione, per quanto riguarda proprio la, la parte di sprechi alimentari è la nostra parte diciamo, sicuramente più virtuosa, ehm, grazie alla legge Gadda, che probabilmente molti di voi conoscono, è appunto una legge che, che, che prevede anche qui degli incentivi fiscali per la donazione. Eh, di cibo. Per quanto riguarda il Giappone loro hanno eh, dei tassi eh, diciamo, eh, di obesità bassi quindi lato salute si comportano molto bene mentre la Germania vediamo un buon utilizzo dell'acqua soprattutto nelle pratiche agricole quindi sul pilastro sostenibilità agricola è, è messa bene. Eh, scusa Ludovica solo sì. per dire eh, intanto scusate anche lo switch tra italiano e inglese ma abbiamo alcuni panelist che sono eh, lingua inglese e altri italiani Um, soltanto per fare un, una domanda, quindi in questa classifica eh, che non riusciamo a vedere eh, adesso per il slide, però per chiarire, eh, abbiamo la Francia in, in prima posizione, eh, eh, il, il Giappone anche che va bene e, e, e l'Italia, possiamo vedere in particolare l'Italia il perché della settima posizione, sì, così capiamo? Grazie. Quindi l'Italia è in settima posizione su 34 paesi, quindi comunque sta sicuramente in posizione alta, si comporta bene per la questione sprechi alimentari, invece siamo messi diciamo, abbastanza male per la questione health challenges, soprattutto perché abbiamo sicuramente dei tassi di longevità buoni, siamo insomma fra i paesi più longevi al mondo e questo lo sappiamo, però c'è un dato che ci dovrebbe un po' allarmare tutti ed è il dato dell'obesità e, e in generale il sovrappeso infantile che siamo praticamente a livello degli americani, ecco. Quindi questo stiamo parlando di un 30% dei bambini e dei ragazzi sotto i 18 anni che è obeso o in sovrappeso. Quindi vuol dire che ci sono generazioni, sono le generazioni più giovani dei nostri figli che stanno mangiando male e dobbiamo stare molto attenti perché sappiamo che le abitudini alimentari che instilliamo appunto nei bambini eh, sono quelle che poi ci porte, si porteranno, anzi loro si porteranno avanti negli anni. Quindi è più probabile ovviamente che un bambino sovrappeso obeso poi sarà un adulto sovrappeso obeso con tutti i, i, i costi. Eh, e di ricadute in termini sia di salute per la persona stessa che di salute pubblica quindi questo sicuramente diciamo, possiamo migliorare lato, lato salute e poi diciamo, abbiamo cercato anche di analizzare siccome oggi parliamo anche eh, di questioni geopolitiche importanti abbiamo fatto un indice di sostenibilità agroalimentare per quanto riguarda proprio le, le regioni del Mediterraneo perché noi sappiamo che le regioni del Mediterraneo non solo diciamo, quelle del nord del Mediterraneo come paesi come Grecia, Italia o Francia ma anche appunto del sud e dell'est del Mediterraneo noi in qualche modo abbiamo delle caratteristiche simili eh, fra questi paesi perché eh, vediamo che abbiamo problemi anche di, di climate change quindi problemi ehm, di, di, di anche di siccità dovuti a questi cambiamenti climatici eh, abbiamo anche qui problemi di, di, di salute nel senso che anche i paesi diciamo del sud del mondo non solo soffrono di food insecurity quindi di insicurezza alimentare ma in realtà purtroppo c'è una cosiddetta transizione nutrizionale quindi anche paesi eh, del sud del Mediterraneo che noi pensiamo magari aderiscano perfettamente alla dieta mediterranea che sappiamo essere una dieta molto salutare, in realtà qua stiamo vedendo uno shifting nutrizionale, quindi un cambiamento nutrizionale importante e un allontanamento progressivo di tutto questo gruppo di 12 paesi che, che abbiamo stilato che si allontana purtroppo dalla dieta mediterranea, mentre sappiamo che la dieta mediterranea è stata definita anche dalla FAO come una dieta sostenibile, nel senso che non solo è salutare per, per le persone con il consumo di frutta e verdura, cereali integrali, noce eccetera, ma è una dieta che ha anche un basso impatto ambientale. Ecco purtroppo per tutta una serie di ragioni, fra cui gli stili di vita sicuramente non aiutano, ehm, sempre più frenetici, poco tempo di cucinare eccetera, ci stiamo allontanando, quindi questa è un'altra attenzione. E, mh, Velocemente, eh, giusto per, per dirvi, diciamo c'è la parte superiore, diciamo la parte nord del Mediterraneo, quindi con Francia, Spagna e anche Portogallo, che eh, diciamo è messa bene nella, nella classifica dei paesi del Mediterraneo per, diciamo, 
ragioni eh, più o meno ovvie, quindi in realtà soprattutto sugli sprechi alimentari mh, nei paesi del nord del Mediterraneo ci sono delle politiche molto attente, mentre i problemi degli sprechi alimentari nel sud del Mediterraneo sono soprattutto dei problemi strutturali e di investimenti anche, perché mancano molto spesso gli investimenti anche banalmente per poter proteggere questo cibo eh, che va dal, dal campo alla tavola, quindi anche proprio nelle fasi di trasporto e di stoccaggio, purtroppo molto spesso mancano sia di infrastrutture proprio di strade sia anche per esempio di sistemi di corretta refrigerazione quindi in questo caso vediamo più che sprechi alimentari mh, dovuti al consumatore qui ci sono per, le cosiddette perdite alimentari quindi cibo che viene perduto nelle prime fasi della filiera agroalimentare bene grazie Ludovica quindi se dovessimo fare una sintesi eh, guardando in giro per il mondo quali sono i paesi eh, dove ci sono delle best practice e dove si possono combattere questi, questi paradossi alimentari e perché? Dunque ci, ci sono delle, delle realtà interessanti, eh, anche se vogliamo non, non solo nei paesi ma anche delle realtà se vogliamo eh, quasi cittadine, per esempio noi sappiamo gli Stati Uniti, facciamo un esempio degli Stati Uniti, in realtà gli Stati Uniti hanno dei problemi di, di salute abbastanza importanti con, soprattutto per quanto riguarda l'obesità e la malnutrizione, quindi sempre stiamo parlando di, di legati al cibo così come hanno sempre degli sprechi alimentari importanti, però per esempio se andiamo a vedere la città di San Francisco eh, si, si comporta in maniera virtuosa con tutta una serie di attività contro gli sprechi alimentari ehm, che ne hanno ridotto notevolmente la portata così come eh, la città di New York. Stessa cosa eh, in, per esempio in Libano eh, che comunque ha dei problemi ovviamente perché ha mancanza proprio per essere un paese molto piccolo a mancanza di suolo agricolo per produrre e mh, quindi ha difficoltà a produrre poi soffre ovviamente anche di de de degradamento del suolo siccità eccetera però ci sono dei progetti molto interessanti interessanti che favoriscono la permacultura, quindi eh, sostanzialmente l'utilizzo eh, di culture sostenibili che allo stesso tempo ovviamente siano efficaci e produttive ma non, diciamo, non vanno a impattare in maniera forte con il suolo, quindi sono diciamo, culture armoniose anche nel punto di, dal punto di vista della, della cultura eh, del suolo. Bene, grazie, grazie mille. Eh, passiamo a Lucio Caracciolo, presidente di Macrogeo, col quale la Fondazione Barilla ha fatto uno studio su cibo e eh, migrazioni, food and migration. Grazie Lucio. Grazie Luca, thank you so much for your attention. First a remark about what you just said about San Francisco and New York, two towns which don't have much to do with the present uh, Uh, government of the United States of America. I think this is something uh, quite remarkable. Um, I will try to show how underestimated is the actual link between migrations and food from a geopolitical perspective. And to that purpose, I will use first this map, uh, which we call the chaos land, which divides our planet roughly in two areas, one uh, what we might call older land with some optimism to which we belong, but we are the frontier of older lands, and the other one uh, which we call the chaos land uh, because there we have an awful concentration of first um, all the wars which are taking place on this planet with the exception of the Ukrainian one. Uh, of uh, social inequalities, concentration of poverty, most interesting failing states and failing institutions, which means that we have de facto countries which appear in our maps but which actually don't exist. For example, Libya, to be uh, uh, very uh, near to our country. Um, or uh, if you wish, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Afghanistan, you may you mention many countries which um, exist only on map. Uh, then we, we have, uh, of course, uh, terrorism, climate change, uh, one of the most uh, intriguing and um, problematic uh, changes in our climate is desertification which affects, by the way, also our country to some extent. Uh, in the last decade, we had an extension of the Sahara Desert 
by 10%, 1% each year, uh, of course, to the south, essentially. And this makes a difference in, of course, also agriculture. So people have to move because they can't live uh, in the lands, in the environments in which their parents, their grandfathers, many generations of their families lived. And this is one of uh, the push factors of migrations. Uh, one thing which is not always very uh, known is the fact that most migrations, the vast majority of migrations in this area, in particular generally in Africa, is not from, uh, uh, let's say, Africa to Europe, but from Africa to Africa, from some parts to, of Africa to other parts, for example, from Central Africa to South Africa, and you take a look to the border, for example, between Botswana and South Africa, and you will see their kind of barriers which you experience in some European, uh, Central European, East European countries. So this is uh, uh, a phenomenon which is um, of vast geopolitical importance, and the connection is uh, very clear if you follow, uh, not the food, but the lack of food, if you follow hunger, if you follow malnutrition, undernourishment, and uh, the crisis of agriculture in many, many areas. Um, one thing which is um, very worrying is the lack of crops. Uh, we absolutely need uh, diversification of crops because 50% of all the crops in this world are provided by rice, maize, soybean, and wheat. Too few uh, to have uh, uh, any chance to reach the goals uh, which the United Nations uh, put to our attention. Um, Another important uh, factor of connection between uh, uh, migration and food is uh, the uh, criminal organizations, not only terrorists, criminal organizations, and to some extent also formal institutions which participate for economic and power reasons to uh, migrations. Um, we have in Africa uh, governments which receive aid from, for example, the European Union or from Western states, uh, and at the same time uh, use their power to help uh, migrations. Why? Also for uh, demographic reasons, if you go to the next picture, for example, and biological reasons. The fact that we have such a gap between life expect expectancy in uh, the north of this, of this planet. And the median age, for example, in Italy, the median age is about 44. In Nigeria, which is the African country, the Western African country uh, from which we get most migrants, we have a median age of less than 20. And they, that makes a difference, not also in terms of biology, but also in terms of attitudes. When you are young, you want to change, if possible, maybe not the world, but the environment in which you live in, uh, when you are 45, you have, let's say, a more conservative approach. And if you look at the next chart, you will see uh, how uh, these uh, uh, tendencies, this trend come together. Uh, there is clearly a correlation between what I showed before, namely uh, expectation of life, and um, median age, and the depth of food deficit, which is very visible in, uh, generally speaking, in Africa, but more specifically in Middle Africa. By the way, one of the problems we have uh, dealing with this issue is that we speak always of Africa and we don't speak of Africas because we have uh, enormous differences um, in uh, this huge continent, which is, uh, of course, in terms of population getting bigger and bigger, uh, 
today we have probably 1 billion and 200 million people in Africa. By 2050, we will have probably the double of that uh, number. And by, 20, uh, by 2100, we will have probably more than 4 million people there, while our uh, population here is decreasing. Um, let me just focus um, on possible, um, I wouldn't say solutions, but a way to uh, um, check uh, this trend and to uh, react to this crisis. And this is exactly the sort of question Lucia wanted to ask. So what okay. can we find answers to migration? We, we, we can, and of course we should find answers, even if we know that these issues will be issues will, which will affect our lives and maybe the lives of our child, children. First of all, I think that we know um, from many sources that those countries which, re which receive less aid perform better than those which receive more aid. Um, and one uh, thing which we have to know is that normally aid is politically biased. It's uh, a way to influence uh, other countries. So it's not only uh, because you are a good man that you help other people, but because you have your interests which are also aided by aid. Uh, so we have to be careful when we speak about international or uh, more specifically national aid. Second, we need to open the trade barriers. We need to lower the trade barriers at least uh, and contain the uh, protection, protectionist trade uh, trends which are uh, increasing worldwide, not only by Mr. Trump. Um, Third, we have to focus on energy projects because, we, for example, in Africa, we have a, a, a very relevant lack in terms of uh, electricity production, and we have half of the population which is not connected, which is not connected to, to the web. And maybe uh, even in terms of phone calls, they don't have any opportunity. So energy is relevant and, of course, solar energy there is, and renewables are um, the, the number one priority. We have now, through new technologies, the possibility of producing electricity without huge plants as we did before. Mm -hmm. And countries, for example, like Morocco are leading uh, the way in this uh, specific area. Um, then a more general uh, issue is the issue of remittances, because one of the main reasons, if not the, the first reason why people leave their countries of origin, I mean young people, is because they fam the families of those people, the enlarged families of those people, send young people to Europe, uh, to Northern Europe, or to America, or elsewhere, because they need remittances. I think that we should, uh, find a way to uh, use, at least uh, to channel uh, part of those remittances to uh, agricultural development, uh, because this is the way uh, for a, a structural change in uh, the relation between uh, food and migration, food and political stability too. Um, and finally, but uh, I think uh, also very important, uh, and I would say also specifically very important to my country, is the fact that we need to produce uh, regular, organized human channels of migration, which is not permitted by, for example, the Italian law now. If you want to come to Italy, you have to go through uh, irregular, uh, clandestine, ways which are controlled by trafficking organizations and this is a, a problem both for those people of course and also for the health for the social health of our society thank you thank you thank you very much lucio um, now over to uh farhana now
um, the media, the journalists, are very much on the front line uh, when it comes to obtaining and achieving the sustainable development goals of the UN. Um, I would like to take this opportunity just to say that um, the Barilla Foundation, together with the Thomson Rogers Foundation, has launched the Food Sustainability Media Award, and all media and journalists are invited to join to uh, raise awareness on the food paradoxes and to try to propose solutions. Um, the hashtag there is Good Food Media Award. So, Farhana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lucha, you made a very important uh, comment on remittances. And um, uh, just to sort of follow up on that, I know I worked for the International Fund for Agricultural Development for many years, and um, IFAD has been working on encouraging at the ground level, country level, better use of the remittances. So people are not just using that on weddings or you know, on extravagant you know, sort of um, purchases, but to channel that into investment in agriculture as well as education. And they're very good examples. So if, if any of you are interested, you might, might like to you know, visit the uh, website of IFAD on that. Um, perhaps the most general way to describe what the enormously increased flow of information does in a developing country is to say that it provides a, a climate for national development. It makes the expert knowledge available where it is needed and provides a forum for discussion, leadership and decision making. It helps to raise the level of aspiration. Um, I think most of you are journalists and probably I'm preaching to the converted. Mass communication serves as the great multiplier in development, the device that can spread the requisite knowledge and attitudes immeasurably more quickly and widely than ever before. We know information is an agent of change. My organization, IPS Interpress Service, since its inception 53 years ago, has believed in the role of information as a precondition for lifting communities out of poverty and marginalization. This belief is reflected in IPS's historic mission, giving a voice to the voiceless, acting as a communication channel that privileges the voices and the concerns of the poorest and creates a climate of understanding, accountability, and participation around development promoting a new international information order between the South and the North. I invite you to visit our website, www.ipsnews.net. Food sustainability, it's a global problem, and we believe that the media has a key role to play. By revealing and highlighting the paradoxes of the modern food system, the media can involve the general public and by guiding them to make more informed food choices, they can consequently help to create a fairer and more sustainable future. IPS is committed to increasing the visibility of food system paradoxes to the public in order to encourage change. Both Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition and IPS firmly believe that the media has a role to play to influence thinking and the way consumers interact with food helping to create a more sustainable and just global food system. Studies show that the framing of news, content analysis is essential as a qualitative approach. Change is positively related to information proposed uncritically and negatively to information contextualized as a highly structured debate. Information provision is often considered to have an important role to play in changing consumers' choices. However, there is still no consensus on the mechanisms by which information might influence specific consumer expenditures, especially in relation to environmentally friendly food products. Not too long ago, at IFAD, the Microsoft founder, Bill Gates, stated, one of the most important priorities is connecting the poorest farmers in the world to breakthroughs in agricultural science and technology. Right now, a digital revolution is changing the way farming is done 
but poor small farmers aren't benefiting from it. Even though there is a digital revolution in farming, smallholder farmers are not benefiting uniformly. And we see that throughout Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Smallholder farmers in some developing countries have seen increased access to agricultural information for production and marketing over the past decade, but this is not in the real sense a revolution. This increase in to and fro information for farmers cannot be compared to the speed at which technologies are being developed, so there must be a problem somewhere. The emerging communication technologies, social media, well, social media has been there for a while, Web2 tools as well, are of no doubt critical in increasing capacity for timely data gathering, knowledge production, and information exchange, even among farmers who are not educated in developing economies. But how can this be done to benefit the target clients? Whose responsibility it is to spearhead the digital revolution among the smallholder farmers. In order that the new communication tools such as mobile phones, feature, and smartphones, iPad, and other tablets, social media platforms like Facebook, YouTube, podcasts, audio and video conferencing, to have impact on researchers, extension officers, and farmers, new strategies have to be developed. And once the necessary capacity is built and tools provided, Delivering information, technical advice, and agricultural skills and training to farmers will follow. It's just not training for farmers. It is also incredibly important to ensure that journalists, especially journalists in developing countries and issues around developing countries, are trained, their capacity built. And I'm sure you, you um, understand what capacity building is learning from them and helping them also learn new technologies or what is out in the market that will help them to enhance their production. Now, nobody knows better than, than the situation in those countries than the people themselves, whether those be journalists, whether those be farmers, or anybody else. So these are people who are not really waiting for handouts or charity. They really need just that little help to do better because they don't always have the means to access what the rest of the world, the developed world, has. So in terms of capacity building of journalists, once they're able to understand and decipher, they'll be able to analyze what the issues are and present it in a way that the general public understand. You know, a short while ago, we were discussing with Luca value chain. Okay, these are things, words that we have learned in the United Nations system through civil um, uh, society organizations. Many of you understand that, but the journalist on the ground does not necessarily understand what it means. So there is a need, you know, to help them to be trained and their capacity built. Information and knowledge play um, a key role in enhancing sustainable agricultural development and ag addressing food security. Rural radio is a relatively inexpensive communication medium and has fairly wide coverage. It can provide farmers with information about farming conditions. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, many of you know that Italy hosts the three food and agriculture organizations of the United Nations Rome is the hub for these three organizations. FAO has rural radio in Africa. Uh, it has a food security channel with programs on food production and productivity. These radios not only aimed at modifying agricultural methods, but they also aimed at changing the state of mind through profound behavior modifications. The use of mobile phones to distribute food market information offers great advantages for consumers and food producers. Farmers can use mobile phones to receive text messages with market information on commodities, market price, supply, demand. Community telecenters in rural areas with access to internet, telephone and fax services 
can play a vital role to make relevant information available to the farmers. Farmers can use these services to enhance communication with potential buyers and to access information on improved farming techniques. With the help of ICTs, farmers can get information on the location of profitable agricultural markets, inquiring about who is paying the highest price, and even contact with their potential buyer to sell their produce online. They can also benefit from mobile banking and government credit programs with reduced transaction costs. Apart from this, there are more specialized applications, especially softwares for supply chain and financial management that can increase the accuracy of the farm operations. Agriculture is the largest source of income for poor rural households. In fact, 500 million small farms provide up to 80% of the food consumed in a large part of the developing world. Investing in technology and building ICT skills for farmers helps ensure food security for the poorest populations and consistent food production for local and global markets, and can also help to achieve the goals for a sustainable development model. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahana. I think I thought the, the radio bit was also particularly interesting as a tool, as a media, which is increasingly uh, not only in the developing world, but throughout the world, um, a very, um, a very good media uh, to use, and it's uh, one that was actually added to the second edition of the Food Sustainability Media Award, uh, which uh, again I invite you to visit uh, goodfoodmediaaward.org, uh, which is uh, the competition that we have together with the Thomson Reuters Foundation. It's the first ever. Um, journalism Award on uh, Food and Sustainability. Now over to uh, Magid, who will be focusing on the water side of things, and water is uh, very much um, involved in food because a lot of the um, food that is produced has virtual or hidden water inside. Thank you, Magid. Thank you, Luca. Um, yeah, as you said, water is actually the primary food. We do need to do all of these things. I would be able, actually, I would think that we would be able to connect the water element to all the 17 SDGs. Without water, we could, we could not achieve zero hunger, we could not end poverty, and so forth. So I would like to go back on one of the last remarks of Dr. Lucio Caracciolo. When you said there is this relation between food and uh, political stability. Now, this is an element that I would like to stress in this presentation in order to show the linkages between all these patterns, migration, climate change, food security, food sustainability, and water insecurity. And I would like to start from water insecurity, just some key facts with a focus on the Mediterranean region. As you can read, uh, 2.1 billion people uh, are facing um, uh, a water stress situation. And uh, 2.1 billion people actually, sorry, use contaminated water. And due to this contaminated water, they are affected by deadly diseases such as dysentery, cholera, and polio. And in the end, around 900,000 people die every year due to unsafe drinking water. Now, uh, relating, relating to the Mediterranean region, the Union for the Mediterranean has evaluated this data. And in particular, 180 million people, as you can read, are considered water poor and 60 million people face water stress. That water stress is actually a result of an index, uh, such as the Food Sustainability Index. We have a water exploitation index, which, is, uh, which was created by the European Environment Agency of the European Union. That index simply measures the relation that we do have between the rates of water that is available in a country and the actual use of, uh, use of that water. That stress, if it is over 40%, it means that that country is water stress. Water stress. Think that countries such as Libya, Jordan, Israel, Malta, and Egypt have a water stress of 100%. Countries such as Algeria and Morocco, they do have around uh, between 45 and 60%. So we clearly have a pressure over water resources in the Mediterranean region. And this is even uh, worsened by the fact that climate change is making the situation even um, even more difficult. Uh, yeah, thanks, going ahead. Let's start from the fact that 
what, which is the connection you know, between water security and security in terms of geopolitical security. Let's start from the fact that all these activities that you, human activities that you see here, drone, such as uh, sanitation, uh, commerce, uh, transportation, farming, as Ludovica <coughs> highlighted before, they are all directly linked to water. And migration, as uh, Dr. Caracciolo said before, is also in some cases a consequence you know, of food insecurity and of water insecurity, of course. So in the moment you have an increase in population, so demographic pressure, an increase in economic pressures on water resources, and an increase in environmental pressures on water resources, so think of climate change, then the risk of water-related conflicts and violence is growing. Let's make some few examples over the Mediterranean. Uh, the problem in this region is that most of the water we do have here is actually shared by two or more nations. So in the moment we have, for example, an environmental pressure such as climate change, which causes droughts and flows and the rains that come into the ground that don't permeate into the ground in the same way, uh, we clearly have a pressure on those water uh, resources that exist in the Mediterranean, which are already limited, under stress. So in the moment that those water resources that are already limited are even affected more by uh, phenomena such as climate change, then the situation becomes a little bit more difficult because you have those water resources which have to be managed by two countries or more, which in some cases in the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa, do not have really friendly relations. So this is also another uh, reason which then can cause not only conflict but migration, as Caracciolo said before. There are many, uh, I would say, agreements over water management in this uh, region, but those agreements are not flexible enough in the sense that they are more in uh, defined quantities. And the quantities might not be the same every year, especially when you have climate change or this uh, phenomenon hitting. So what can the media do in all of this? You know, we do hold the responsibility as uh, journalists, analysts, or, or whatsoever. Any person who or institution which is a, a vehicle of information holds a huge responsibility because uh, the information we do uh, produce through the research on the ground or we just sample, simply uh, translate into other languages and so forth, those are the information that could impact on this criticality. So what can the media do in detail? I've listed here a few uh, things that uh, we as representatives of media or of think tanks or whatsoever can do. But there are many other things that we could. We could convey information uh, which then contribute to educate and sensitize the general public, uh, the public obviously. Uh, we as media can serve as watchdogs in the sense that we are able to bring attention to these uh, important issues, to important problems, and hold those responsible uh, accountable. We can, as um, IPSDG raised before, give voice to the voiceless. You know? So by giving, you know, taking the chance, giving the chance to those people, ordinary people, the civil society, to raise their voice and have the chance to interact with governments, that's also another thing that through the media we are able to reach. And obviously, we hold the huge responsibility to change the mentality over a lot of things, over food sustainability, over water sustainability, and so forth. So we have the chance as media, um, uh, as members from the media or analysts or whatsoever, to raise the volume and impact, you know, have an impact over populations. You know. We can shock and inspire, shock over climate change, inspire change in the behavior of people over food sustainability, over water footprint. Just to give you an example, I was reading a research a few days ago of the water footprint of an average American. If I tell you the number, you probably would not believe what is the number you know, of that footprint. It's actually 32 glasses of water per day. So one average American has this water footprint on the environment. That American, obviously, he or she is not drinking that water daily. The issue lays down in the fact that most of that water calculated, 96% in particular, is actually hidden. It's hidden in the water that is used to produce the food that that American uh, is. It's used to produce 
the clothes that that American um, wear, because cotton, in, obviously, it needs water to be produced. And most of the water is also used to recycle the polluted water and make it, more, and make it drinkable again. So think about the role of the media, uh, which through uh, valuable analysis and um, targeting specific issues can have in addressing, for example, the awareness over food sustainability, water sustainability, a more sustainable management of all these natural resources. And finally, obviously, the media can connect politicians, so those who actually are the decision makers, with the water planners, so I mean with the field practitioners, for example, in less developing countries, with the ordinary people. So with those communities who actually face those challenges daily. So the role of media is crucial. You know, we are able to raise the awareness and achieve you know, a better public advocacy. Then I would like to end with this few remarks taking the title of our panel discussion here. You know, it's End Poverty, Protect the Planet, Ensure Prosperity for All. Now the panel discussion suggests to us also the answer. You know, food is the answer. I would have said that water is the answer. I would have deleted the word food, but then I thought that it wouldn't have been correct. So I would say that water is the primary answer because we need water to produce food. And let me explain you why there is a linkage between water and all this you know, parts of the sentence, why water is the tool to achieve uh, the end of poverty, to protect the planet, and to ensure prosperity for all. You know, as, uh, as an analyst, as a researcher, I'm used to pose a research question at the beginning, and we did already have a research question with the panel discussion title, and try to give an, a research answer at the end. So let's make a trial. Now, ending poverty, how? Uh, most of the world's poor uh, are farmers. We already said that before. Now, if we allow those farmers to become more productive, you know, we are helping those farmers to uh, not only produce more and then obviously to survive, but also to help their economies, you know, to thrive their economies and their, mm, and their healthy communities, they make their, their, their communities healthier. So through water, which is a tool through which we can guarantee you know, actually farming, we are able to end poverty. I'm not saying that we do need only water, but actually water is the primary tool without which you could not even think about food sustainability and sustainable farming. Now, protecting the planet. Uh, since we are speaking in particular about water, uh, the UN World Water Day, uh, which was celebrated on the 22nd of March, had a theme this year which was natural for water, so turning to water in order to overcome water challenges. So that is simple. Turning to natural-based uh, natural solutions, for example, mm, with planting of new forests, reconnecting rivers and food plants, restoring wetlands, turning to the planet itself, to our environment, so preserving the environment, which includes obviously water, which is produced, for example, inside forests, we can allow, for example, those communities to have a sustainable environment through which they can farm in a more sustainable way, produce more, and then end poverty. So you see there, there is an obvious connection between these statements. And finally, prosperity. Still, it is, connect, it is connected, it is a consequence. Once you help those communities climb out, um, climb out of poverty, you know, you're helping them to achieve prosperity because you're helping them to achieve a stable income. And uh, uh, one last word, that this thing of ensuring prosperity doesn't come only for the developing countries. It comes also for the developed countries because, as I told you before, making that example of the water footprint uh, of an average American. So think about the reduce of the water footprint also in a developed country, how much, you know, how many resources we could say thanks to the reduction of that water footprint. So that's a reasoning which goes both in the direction uh, of um, raising the awareness in the developing countries, but I would say also and mostly in the developed countries. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Magid. And I think we can uh, reconcile the water and food uh, element by putting them together because water is, is part of something that we eat. So I think that uh, we can reconcile the two. But thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting to highlight how water is so essential together with food for the SDGs. Uh, Lucio Caracciolo was showing me just now something which is very interesting, that the Rome province is looking for farmers, uh, but that 
it can't find farmers because uh, people don't want to do it. And I think this goes back, Lucia, to what you were saying before, that if we have a regular organized migration, that could be a potential solution. Now, uh, uh, quickly turning to uh, Laura, um, because we're running out of time. Laura was the most recent winner of the uh, Barilla Foundation Young Earth Solutions Project, and uh, she will tell us quickly how biodiversity, which is something that we, uh, the world already has, we should preserve what we have. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. So let's switch again to Italian. So turn on and off your headphone, please. Uh, perché quello che voglio presentarvi oggi è il mio progetto che si chiama YesVet. Io sono un biologo e quindi il mio progetto cerca di porsi concretamente in quello che sono gli obiettivi della sostenibilità promossi dalle Nazioni Unite. E in particolare si pone nel contesto dell'obiettivo 12, cioè cercare di raggiungere una produzione e un consumo più sostenibile. Agricoltura. Agricoltura oggi significa un uso eh, di sostanze chimiche, in particolare di pesticidi, per combattere insetti che danneggiano gravemente le colture, ma queste sostanze eh, inquinano l'acqua, inquinano il suolo, inquinano il cibo che mangiamo e quindi sono anche un rischio per la salute umana. Ma non solo, agricoltura oggi significa anche una perdita degli habitat naturali per convertire la terra alle pratiche agricole. Quindi questo ha causato e sta causando in molti paesi, compresa l'Italia, una perdita di habitat e di biodiversità tremenda, incredibile, massiva. Eh, quella biodiversità che è un patrimonio fondamentale dell'umanità, che deve essere preservato anche per le generazioni future. Da qui quindi l'esigenza di trovare delle strategie innovative che permettano proprio di raggiungere una produzione più sostenibile, più rispettosa dell'ambiente, preservando comunque le rese e cercando di avere, far avere un cibo sano a tutti. Quindi il progetto YesBet nasce proprio come una riflessione su questi obiettivi di sviluppo sostenibile, una riflessione mia della dottoressa Angela Boggero del CNR, Istituto per lo Studio degli Ecosistemi di Verbania, e della dottoressa Elena Patriarca della stazione teriologica piemontese. Noi pensiamo che quello che ci serve è quello che già abbiamo, il potere della biodiversità di aiutare a raggiungere una produzione sostenibile. Per cui um, YesBet promuove una strategia di lotta integrata agli insetti pesti in agricoltura che è basata sull'incremento sull dei servizi ecosistemici forniti dai pipistrelli in ambiente agricolo e in particolare in risaia. Servizi ecosistemici intesi come quei benefici multipli che l'ecosistema e l'ambiente fornisce al genere umano. Ogni pipistrello eh, consente di, eh, mantenere, eh, di limitare le popolazioni di insetti dannosi. Pensate che un solo pipistrello ogni notte può cacciare fino a 1500-2000 insetti, quindi un'azione di controllo incredibile. Eh, quello che eh, quindi cerchiamo di fare con questo progetto è di creare delle condizioni in cui i pipistrelli possano aumentare, quindi aumentare le popolazioni di pipistrelli che ogni notte cacciano sui campi. E come lo facciamo? Il progetto è iniziato a gennaio, abbiamo creato 60 bat box, che sono questi rifugi artificiali, progettati proprio per incoraggiare i pipistrelli in aree dove non ci sono rifugi naturali. Pensiamo ai campi, alle aree agricole, non ci sono alberi, non ci sono eh, margini boscati, non ci sono proprio dei rifugi per gli animali. Quindi eh, abbiamo costruito questi, questi rifugi e nelle scorse settimane li abbiamo installati in tre aziende agricole pilota, ho dei lividi che possono testimoniare che è stata veramente un'azione importante, e quello che andremo a fare nei prossimi mesi è andare a valutare la colonizzazione di queste bat box, ma non solo, eh, pre preleveremo il guano che si raccoglie sotto queste bat box e andremo ad analizzarlo con tecniche di metagenomica. Questo perché vogliamo proprio capire qual è il controllo che effettuano i pipistrelli sugli insetti pest, quindi quale pest vengono consumate e, e quanto. Ma non solo, cercheremo anche di capire se i pipistrelli possono essere delle sentinelle precoci dell'arrivo di nuove entomopeste emergenti. Um, entomopeste emergenti intese come quegli insetti che non sono nativi di un'area, ma arrivando da altre zone possono causare degli enormi danni alla produzione perché non hanno competitor. 
Analizzando il guano cercheremo proprio di vedere se riusciamo ad avere un'informazione tempestiva e molto precoce sull'arrivo di questi insetti e quindi poter applicare delle azioni tempestive di controllo su aree molto più limitate, quindi un, un utilizzo di pesticidi nel caso dovessero servire molto molto più limitato. Eh, non solo, eh, quindi cercare di diminuire l'uso delle sostanze chimiche che inquinano l'ambiente, l'acqua, il suolo, ma anche cercare di avere un cibo più sano per tutti e, e avere nuove rese. Questi sono gli obiettivi di ESPET, ma anche di proteggere la biodiversità. I pipistrelli sono specie protette. Eh, abbiamo 34 specie in Italia, sono tutte inserite nella direttiva Habitat perché sono molte sono a rischio di estinzione proprio a causa dell'uomo e spesso a causa dei pesticidi. Quindi ehm, quello che cercheremo di fare anche alla fine del progetto è una, promuovere la building capacity dei, degli agricoltori. Eh, svilupperemo delle best practice, delle linee guida per cercare di far capire agli agricoltori proprio il valore della biodiversità, del, uh, del, della naturalità di, degli elementi e quindi cercarli di aiutarli a capire proprio che è importante tenere delle zone boscate, degli alberi, dei margini, dei filari che favoriscano la biodiversità. E questo è un altro degli obiettivi di sostenibilità promossi dalle Nazioni Unite. Stiamo avendo già qualche risultato, la Regione Piemonte ci ha chiesto di presentare il progetto perché dall'anno prossimo finanzieranno l'installazione delle batbox e eh, l'installazione di la piantumazione di alberi e siepi al 100% a quegli agricoltori che ne faranno richiesta. Quindi è già un buon passo avanti. Eh, un sistema alimentare quindi per conseguire più obiettivi, che cerchi, che cerchi di agire in maniera sinergica per conseguirne mh, il più possibile. Lasciatemi prendere in prestito questa frase, think global, act local. Pensiamo in maniera globale, cerchiamo di agire a livello locale per raggiungere questi obiettivi e questa è la soluzione che io trovo importante per raggiungere la, pro la prosperità e la protezione dell'ambiente. Grazie. Bene, grazie. Thank you, thank you very much, Laura. Uh, well, we hope that we were able to at least um, partly answer the question for you, so how you can end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all, and how food and water uh, have a, a key role to play. Um, so I'm going to leave it now for any questions. Um, Lucio Caracciolo, I know, has to leave in, uh, in just a couple of minutes, so if there's any specific questions for Lucio Caracciolo, if you could ask them now. Uh, and then uh, for everybody here on the panel, we are ready for your questions. Grazie. It's interesting to know. Could you, sorry, that could you just please your, your name and. Uh, My name is Eileen McGurk, I'm Canadian. Okay. Um, it's interesting to note that the panelists all have bottles of water in front of them. And I'm wondering what would be the influence in the uh, developing world if people in the developed world use tap water rather than bottled water. Uh, Maggie, do you want to take that question, given you are the water expert? expert. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I was thinking about the same thing this morning, really. Um, it's a tough challenge, you know. It's a tough challenge because these things are, uh, I mean, changing this behavior would mean changing entirely our life. I would not say that is impossible, but at the moment with the um, current situation, you know, looking at the political wills of the current decision makers, it is clear that we are not going towards that direction soon. You know, because since you don't have the political will of decision makers to change that course, then it's impossible to change that course. Uh, at the same time, I'm, mm, I would like to you know, shed the light over many best practices that are happening in the world, both in the developed world and in developing countries, which are drastically changing this situation. Uh, we could list many, and on the 17th of April, so in a few days, there will be an official launch of a project promoted by um, some scientists working for the Union of the Mediterranean, which is named Plastic Busters, 
and it's actually um, it's very technical. I don't know the details on how it works, but it's actually about the reduction of plastic waste in the Mediterranean really. There are many other initiatives like this happening worldwide because as you all know probably uh, the um, expansion of those plastic islands is dramatic at the moment. So, but there is someone who is acting, you know. The problem is that it's not enough under the light or what is not under the light of the media in particular is the footprint we do have on the environment by using one plastic bottle or by using too much water. Think about tourism also. You know, tourism is one of the most important economic activity for the Mediterranean, okay? So it's a positive asset for the Mediterranean region. But at the same time, tourism has a huge negative impact because, you know, I've written here some data, but the point is that uh, the amount of water, you know, the water footprint of a tourist it's like millions and millions more, you know, the one of a tourist, uh, compared to the one of a normal citizen of the southern eastern Mediterranean um, region. And if we think that we could reduce, you know, our water footprint in the developed world, and that would make an impact, have an impact in the developing countries also, you know, it's, it's a way to show that we are interconnected, especially in the Mediterranean region. What we do, do, what, what we do here in the, in the developed world does affect what happens in the developing countries in the Mediterranean region. Yeah. So, yeah, go on. Just to say that it's a tough challenge, but many best practices are already taking place, and uh, we should be optimists. But at the same time, we should be uh, quite aware of the drama of this situation because uh, we are running out of time, actually. Our planet is saying that is saying that to us. Well, no, thanks for that question. It's a challenge, and we will uh, we can take this up with the organizers of the International Journalism Festival, and maybe next year we will see you know water from Perugia or Umbria uh, here on our tables. We have one more question over there, please. Time is time is up. Okay, sorry. One one final question. Ultima domanda. Eh, mi chiamo Paola, volevo sapere se mangiare o non mangiare carne ha un'influenza nel porre fine alla povertà, proteggere il pianeta, garantire la prosperità. E se mangiamo tutti i vegetali è sostenibile? Ok, uh, um, I think Ludovica can take this question. Che altro richiede un regime totalmente autoritario? <laughs> non credo che uno spontaneamente non mangi carne, lo deve obbligare. Dunque, sì, ovviamente è, è qualcosa che deve venire dall'individuo, è una questione di sensibilità personale, sicuramente diciamo, partiamo, partiamo da questo presupposto. Noi della, della Fondazione Barilla abbiamo proposto la cosiddetta piramide alimentare e ambientale insieme, quindi si chiama la doppia piramide, potete andarla a vedere sul sito barillacfn.com. Cosa diciamo in questo senso? Diciamo che abbiamo notato che i cibi che effettivamente impattano maggiormente sull'ambiente sono anche quelli che, fanno, uh, che, fanno, insomma, che andrebbero consumati con moderazione, viceversa i cibi che dovremmo consumare maggiormente perché hanno uh, diciamo, dei contenuti nutritivi molto buoni per la nostra salute sono anche quelli che hanno un impatto inferiore sulla terra. Tra questi la carne, noi sappiamo appunto c'è questo grande... Eh, risveglio anche delle persone la carne, soprattutto la carne rossa ha degli impatti ambientali molto molto grandi e abbiamo visto con la fondazione non necessariamente dobbiamo essere ve tutti vegetariani perché appunto sappiamo magari a qualcuno mh, non interessa per tutta una serie di ragioni essere completamente vegetariani ma già eh, andare verso una cosiddetta dieta sostenibile quindi per esempio consumare carne rossa in particolare ma in generale carne soltanto due volte a settimana invece che per esempio tutti i giorni e può avere dei, dei notevoli impatti ambientali sia rispetto appunto al water footprint quindi impronta di, di acqua perché sappiamo appunto che per produrre questa carne rossa è necessaria tantissima acqua eh, per, per i terreni, per i pascoli eh, che, che, che ci vanno eh, così come anche lo stesso land usage e in generale le emissioni di, di gas sera quindi la risposta è sì dovremmo eh, consumare sicuramente meno carne per vivere meglio e per avere meno impatti sull'ambiente Ok, grazie mille, grazie a tutti. Dobbiamo chiudere che il tempo è finito, grazie. Thank you.